This is why, obviously, counterfires are such a technologically advanced <laughs> organisation. I haven't managed to hit the start button on time yet. Um, I, I just want to make, uh, first of all, just a couple of remarks about uh, uh, the impact of the, um, the Arab revolutions, uh, particularly, I think, the Egyptian revolution, um, on, uh, on politics in this country, because um, one of the things that we, we didn't mention in discussing the demonstrations uh, this morning and the kind of... Um, mobilization that went on for them is the impact of having a series of revolutionary upheavals in the Middle East. Now it's difficult to quantify exactly what that meant. It's obvious that people demonstrated yesterday primarily for their, uh, for their own reasons and according to a dynamic which is decided um, uh, by events uh, in this country. Uh, but I also think um, it's impossible to miss the impact that that huge example of what um, the revolutionary power of people is had on uh, on people in in this country. I think it was in their minds. I think it gave an example of what mass mobilisation um, was was, a, was about. Uh, and I certainly think that you saw the the placards and demonstrations. I mean, I thought actually, in, in some ways, that the depth to which it had travelled was probably best shown by the um, the official. Um, fire brigades union banner that was held mm. that was um, up on uh, I think uh, what, Waterloo Bridge actually I think um, which had Egypt Wisconsin you know workers stand together fight together that that shows you I think the impact of the of the uh, of the revolution and I think um, uh, a, a second point which I want to make is 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 in response. Um, not to its sort of general impact on the consciousness of, of workers, but uh, in, point, in response to the point that was being made earlier about how do you take people from being kind of opposed to the cuts to understanding that it's the whole system we're fighting, uh, we're fighting against. Well, to be honest, um, the revolutionary experience in the Arab world is, a, you know, I suppose this is a, a long theme of what have the Egyptians ever done for us, but um, one of the things that the Egyptians and others have done for us <laughs> is to dramatise the fact that a revolutionary transformation can take place in the 21st uh, in the 21st century, and there can be a challenge to the entire regime, if not to the entire system. So I think sometimes, you know, if you simply follow the logic of what happens in domestic politics around the cuts, then it seems like how do we make that last jump between being opposed uh, to the cuts to talking about revolution and transforming the system? But if you think of the the interconnections between the, the situations, if you think about it in the international dimension as well as in the domestic dimension, then I think revolution is in the minds now of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people that it wasn't in the minds of back at the beginning, uh, back at the beginning of January. In fact, the, the way I put it is this, if you look at the sort of 10 year span, more than 10 year span of, of kind of transformative mass experience, I would say, and look at it through the lens of the language that becomes acceptable and used by ordinary people, I would say the uh, Seattle demonstration um, put the terms capitalism and anti-capitalism uh, from being um, words used by the left to describe the situation to words used by millions of ordinary people to describe uh, the situation. I would say that the Iraq war took the words imperialism and anti-imperialism out of a category simply used by the left and put it into the understanding of uh, masses of, of, of people. And I would say that what has happened with the Arab revolution is it's taken the word revolution out of the phraseology of simply belonging to the left into uh, a, a, an understandable experience um, that uh, tens of hundreds of thousands of people are in some way intellectually, emotionally uh, engaged, engaged with and we should uh, you know, we should um, treasure that moment, really, because it's not very often that the impact of a revolutionary experience allows you to talk in this language, to debate state power, to debate how you confront state power, about what the alternative to the entire system was. And that is a, it is a tremendous gift to the entire left, and not to uh, exploit it, not to use it to the full, is both a disservice uh, to the Egyptians and others who've made the revolution, but more importantly, it's a disservice uh, to ourselves. So we should always, I think, be talking about this uh, this uh, experience. The uh, second point I want to make is, um, when we made this point right at the beginning, that, that these revolutionary experiences are, of course, unique to themselves. They have characteristics which no previous revolutionary experience um, has, has produced, which needs to be analyzed and understood uh, view, but they also have 
they also follow a pattern of previous revolutionary experiences, not wholly, but in part, and we can only understand them by bringing that history that, uh, that history to bear. So we said right at the beginning, I think one of the first articles that we put on the website was about Tunisia. I wrote an article called The, the Tunisian Revolution in, in the Historic Context, in which I said that there is a, a, a process by which all revolutions open up with what Engels called the revolution of the flowers, where an entire society almost revolts against a very, very tiny and isolated governmental elite, a discredited elite, discredited even among large sections of their own class and of the middle class as well as among workers. But as the revolution unfolds, there's a process of political differentiation and class differentiation which takes place, which typically produces a series of crises within uh, the revolutions, and in some cases, uh, a second revolutionary experience, obviously most famously in Russia. We have a February uh, revolution of exactly this kind, which in which the whole society revolts against Tsarism, and then a series of crises before you get to the point where it's a second revolution. Now, not every revolution has a February and an October. Actually, in most cases, most revolutions are interrupted, if you like, at some point between February um, and, uh, and October. But nevertheless, the, the potential to, is there in every revolution. And the crises, however resolved, that that first revolution creates uh, also occur uh, in, uh, in other revolutions as well. And because the Arab revolutions are an international series of revolutions, because they're a very deep social process, you can see this um, uh, um, unfolding in a, in, in a, in actually in a very fast way. I mean, I said, I think at the meeting, when I first came back from uh, Egypt, I was in Egypt twice during the, the process of the revolution, that um, the meeting that we had at Conway, that Dino and I spoke on the, the platform of, that there would be, you couldn't have a series of revolutions in the Middle East without there being a response from the imperial powers. It's too important to them, resource-wise, uh, geostrategically. Uh, it's too important for them not to respond to a series of popular revolutions. And I put the time frame of it, of it being something like 12 months or 24 months. Actually, the Libyan, the intervention in the Libyan war came within a matter of weeks uh, of that. And I think we have to understand it primarily as a response to imperialism, to the advance of the Arab Revolution, to trying to, um, to, uh, trying to uh, 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 gain a foothold in a fast-moving uh, situation, trying to freeze the process. It, it happens coincidentally. Well, I say coincidentally, by which I mean at the same time as, but not by coincidence, um, with the uh, Saudi and other Gulf states intervening in uh, in Bahrain. Com combined, the intervention in Libya and the intervention in Bahrain is an attempt to draw a line uh, under the revolutions and to re-establish some kind of Western um, interference in the process of uh, of, uh, of the of, of the revolution. It's most marked. It, it's a military, obviously, a military intervention. Uh, in, uh, in Libya precisely because the Libyan revolution took the form of a civil war. And in a civil war, what happens is that in the liberated areas, the old state power collapses absolutely. So it's not a, it, it becomes a process which is different than the process in Tunisia and Egypt where you have the fall of the old regime and then there's a kind of political battle taking place for how far the democratic transition will take place and whether or not on top of the democratic democratic transition questions of class power of working class control of the society also erupt in the middle of the revolution that takes place if you like within the frame of the uh, tunisian uh, revolution as it was established by the fall of ben ali and as the egyptian revolution was established the framework that was established i don't mean settled framework i mean the balance of class forces as it was established by the fall of mubarak but in Libya, because in a civil war the, the, it is territorially separated, not simply politically and class separated, the Benghazi regime grew out of popular councils um, which uh, were a complete replacement of the old order. There's no Tentawi in Benghazi. He's in, he's in Tripoli commanding other military, uh, other military uh, forces. So that process was different, and it was a and it was the beginnings of actually of a very different model, um, or a, a commune model of what would happen. And I think one of the reasons why they did is to break that, is to try and get a foothold in that process. Now we should be clear: once they do interfere, that process can take on a very different character. It's obvious that inside the Benghazi regime, the interference of the imperialists is banking up those elements. Actually, those elements that were closest to or defected from the Gaddafi regime 
as a pro-Western proxy inside the Benghazi regime. So they're, what they're trying to do, that the effect of uh, what they're doing is to turn the revolutionary experience in a pro-Western in a pro-Western direction. Now that's not the only reason for opposing the intervention in, in Libya. There are a host of others, but we're much more common. We, we have we have much more understanding of those because they are common with things that we've opposed, the intervention that we've opposed in Afghanistan and Iraq, but noticing what the effect of Western intervention is on the Libyan revolution, how it attempts to create within the revolution, even within the revolutionary camp, a basically pro-American uh, strand of, uh, of opinion, I think is very, very important. Now, it's an unstable situation. They may not do that. There's been a series of crises, actually, within the Benghazi regime where uh, for instance, the, the, uh, the Gaddafi head of the defence ministry who uh, has been pushed aside and they've replaced him with somebody else who I don't actually know anything about, but that won't be a stable process either. As they begin to advance, they seem to have done in the last few days, there will come a question for the Americans, do we really want these people running all the way uh, to Tripoli? Do we, uh, have we got enough control of them? How will we try and, try and freeze that situation? So I think it's a very fluid situation. But once the Western powers intervene, our job, our primary job here, is to stop that happening. Because that's how you create the space, not only for the Libyan revolution to develop, if it can, but for the other revolutions in the Arab world to develop, uh, develop as well. Um, I'll just say a little bit, uh, um, I'll just say a little bit about, uh, about the situation in, in, in Egypt. Um, I mean, Dina will know uh, much, more than, much more than I do, but it's, it strikes me that um, that there is now um, a, a, a very um, a very dangerous moment um, for the Egyptian revolution because um, we had a situation where I would say up until a couple of weeks ago when um, the mass movement essentially got rid of the replacement prime minister, actually the <coughs> replacement prime minister got rid of Ahmed uh, 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 Shakib. Uh, as, the, as the second replacement prime minister, and, and more importantly still, when they stormed the Amandala, the state security buildings, um, that was, a, that was a, a further outburst of revolutionary energy which pulled down some more of the old Mubarak, Mubarak <laughs> state. But since that point, the army in its own name, for the first time in its own name, using its own forces, has been operating uh, against the revolutionaries, attacked the women's <laughs> movement on International Women's Day, um, set, uh, was part of setting going uh, a, a conflict between cops and Muslims of, of, of attacking the cops um, and, has, and, and has cleared Taliyah Square on at least one occasion uh, using, its own, uh, using its own forces in preparation for and in the context of the referendum that took place a, well, a week ago, isn't it, I think, um, over whether or not the army's very limited amendments to the constitution would pass or not. Now, referenda are the form of election which dictatorial regimes like most, because they're the ones that have the least democratic process in it. Um, you know, Hitler famously was formed of, rev rev of referenda. Um, uh, de Gaulle actually managed to halt the, the, the explosion of 68 using, uh, uh, using a, a referenda. It's a kind of way of, 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 an, of a dictatorial regime gaining some electoral legitimacy and, uh, and allowing revolutionary forces the least possible scope and the least possible time to develop political arguments. In a way, what's happening in Tunisia, where there's an election for a constituent assembly, which will decide the change in the constitution, and I'm just talking about bourgeois democratic options, and there are bourgeois democratic options which are more favorable for the left and some which are less favorable for the left, and the referendum is one of the less favorable for the left uh, uh, possibilities. And the fact that the yes vote um, was won most of the left was, uh, I mean, the, the referendum is quite a complex thing, because I think it sucked in elements of the population that weren't involved in the, re in the revolution at all, virtually, especially in the country, uh, in the country <coughs> areas. It polarized the question in a way which the left wouldn't necessarily have chosen uh, to polarize it. It was portrayed as a cop, you know, the cops were supposed to be against the thing, and the, and the Muslims were supposed to be in favor of the yes vote, so it polarized on sectarian lines in a way which wasn't a characteristic of the revolution at all. So in all aspects, it was a kind of regressive uh, vote to, to take place, and the outcome was a yes vote uh, for the army's constitutional, very limited constitutional amendments. And since then, you can see the impact that that's had, because there is now a draft law banning um, protests and strikes. People can have a year's 
I think it was a year in prison and a huge fine, an absolutely massive fine for organising it. I mean, and there are jokes going around about we have everybody, whoever you tweets, will they be fined for or jailed for tweeting about a protest and so forth? But it's a serious, it's a serious threat. Now, on the other side uh, of the equation, there have been new union uh, federations uh, built, very big ones uh, uh, often. There's been a Democratic Labour Party uh, formed, which involves, if I'm correct, the revolutionary left, both organisations of the revolutionary left, the revolutionary socialists and socialist renewal, uh, current and sections of the Communist Party and, uh, and, uh, and others. And so there is building, if you ask me, an absolutely classic confrontation between those who want the democratic demands of January the 25th, or the beginning <coughs> of the revolution, that is, to be seen through, plus class demands uh, to be, uh, be recognised, and the old order, which is trying to restabilise itself um, uh, uh, around uh, a democratic process. And I think there's a debate to be had here in the wider movement about the Egyptian revolution and in Egypt itself about what democracy <laughs> means. Because you begin to hear people talking as if democracy is the, the picture you know, the, the, the advertisement of liberal democracy that you get in the West, that we should be involved. We have to be better, you know, you hear this stuff on Facebook, we have to be better at, you know, organising our supporters in the electoral process. Now, anybody who's actually experienced Western democracy knows that what's valued by Western democracy is freedom of association, freedom of speech, uh, freedom to support trade unions, freedom to strike, freedom to protest, and the electoral process is actually something which is designed to limit those. And I don't think that that's fully understood, that, that, is, that there is our freedom and theirs, our democracy and theirs. And that's an argument which I think that, that actually we need to, uh, to refresh in our own minds to understand what's happening in Egypt. And I think it's a, insofar as we have any purchase and discussion with uh, Egyptian socialists, it's an argument which I think who, as time has definitely come because that second stage of the revolution has opened up, also opened up in Tunisia, back, which I know much less that I want to talk about it, but that's definitely, I think, that, uh, where we are. So in all sorts of ways now, and I haven't talked about you know, Syria and Yemen, where the, where the revolutionary process is still, is still a, 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 a advancing, um, but it's advancing with this more complex history and with the imperial intervention uh, taking place. So I think we're going to have to watch events very closely, analyze them, uh, very clearly and continue uh, to both understand them for our own purposes because to be honest some of the strategic discussions of course they're not in, you know, here and there they're very different like different scale of events and so forth and so on but when we have the discussion earlier about you know how the left relate to the wider movement believe me that is the discussion on the Egyptian left how do the people who were at the core of January 25th relate to a mass of millions of Egyptians who perhaps even weren't necessarily engaged in that in that in that process. You know, millions can make a revolution, but millions can actually not actively participate in it. But they can be brought into the process at a later stage. And then the question arises on an absolutely huge scale. How does the advanced section, both of the left in particular, but <coughs> of revolutionaries in general, of the of the hundreds of thousands who were actively engaged in Tahir Square and other places, how do they relate to the counter thrust by the old regime and the involvement in the revolutionary process of people who weren't engaged in its initial scale. So you're dealing with an absolutely sort of society-wide uh, convulsion involving millions of people compared to our perhaps tens of thousands of people, but some of the same dynamics are there and you can only, you know, you know that's why the, the Russian Revolution and the other revolutions remain such sort of huge points of reference for us because all the small debates that we have are had in these processes on an absolutely massive canvas. And so all the errors and all the successes are magnified and easier uh, to read. Um, I'll leave that.